God rules the heaven, but on earth, I rule. Genghis Khan. This film was made in the Philippine Islands by Filipino artists in the Tagalog language. It is the simple story, not of world conquest, but of the youth of a conqueror. What we of the West might call the formative years. It is told in terms not of history, but of folk epic, of legend. begins on a morning 700 years ago in a little green space amid the infinite desolations of the Gobi Plain with the meeting of four hostile chieftains, among them Yesu Tai, the wise ruler of the Mongols. They came by invitation of Chief Bor Chu of the Karaites. For what purpose they had still to learn. And in token of truce, they thrust the points of their tribal emblems into the block of honor. But honor never puts mortal enemies at ease. The children of Yesu Tai watched him, anxious and loyal. And the uneasiest of all was their host, the imbecilic Borchu. Surely they see through our scheme, Targut, he babbled to his chief counselor. Relax, Targu reassured him. Keep quiet. Let your nephew do the talking. Father, asked the Princess Li Hai, why are you so fidgety? Quiet, child. Don't cry. Just listen to your cousin, Urgo. It was the Mongol Yesu Tai who spoke first for those who had come. We have cast down our emblems. We come in peace. Why have you invited us to come here? We demand an explanation. So Ergo, hiding his guile behind a priestly mask, began to explain in more words than becomes an honest man. Our very lives depend upon the oasis of Bermacho. But if we continue, as in the past, to dispute the ownership in blood, None of us will survive to enjoy the benefits. <laughs> May I please make a suggestion? Make it and be quick about it. Let us be done forever with strife and bloodshed. Let us settle our quarrel through a tournament of champions. Let each tribe choose its best warrior to contend with mine in two events. The man who wins both, his tribe will own the oasis. The defeated tribes will pay a fee to the owner for watering and grazing. Will you abide by this agreement?
We will abide by the agreement. Then bring forth your champions. Let the games begin. Nakasulat po dito ang mga paglalaban. Are you trying to insult me? Insult you? The last thing we would dream of doing. These are simply the regulations in written form. Do I understand that you find them objectionable? Of course not. Nevertheless, I consider it an insult, for you know very well I cannot read. An unpardonable error, for which it would be idle to beg your forgiveness. However, since we are all in agreement, let the first contest begin. The champions are ready. Karpu of the Madrigus, Prince Temujin of the Mongols, son of Yesu Tai, Vazmir the Tartar, and for Bor Chu, the mercenary Amalek the Taichut. The contest, the rolling of boulders between lines of flame. The instruments allowed each contestant a rope, a quarterstaff, his strength. Beside his opponents, Temujin seemed almost girlish. And as luck or trickery would have it, he drew the heaviest boulder. People began to wonder why on earth he stepped forward for his tribe. And then it became obvious to everyone that he had gone out of his mind. Temujin hadn't lost his mind. He was using it to find a way out against impossible odds and total defeat. The instruments of victory, a rope, a quarter staff, and the ability to find the best use for them. The death of force is the birth of cunning. under pressure was always to be Temujin's genius. In moving heavy objects, his device is used to this day. The second event is wrestling. Everything is permitted. The feet, the knees, the head, the teeth. The last man standing is the winner.
It did look as if Temujin had met his match in this invulnerable giant of the Mondragos. <laughs> But no chain was ever forged without one weak link. And Temujin was the man to seek it out. So the Mongols were declared the winners and the owners of the oasis. And in token of goodwill, an arrow was built. There were other promising tokens of goodwill. Tonight, the victorious Mongols feasted so expansively that even the losers were happy. The hero of the hour was so busy that it was late in the evening before the Princess Lehigh could get him to herself. But now at last, in a nice secluded place, away from all the noise, she began her courtship. something? I'm glad it was you who won. My father is awfully annoyed. He says that from now on we have to pay you some kind of tax to use the oasis. But I don't mind, because now that everybody will stop fighting, we can be friends. We are friends, aren't we? It's so simple. You hear them all outside. They're off their guard. At a signal, our warriors will kill a lot of them. Kill them? Hmm, I see. But if my daughter gets wind of this, she'll never let me hear the last of it. You only worry about her should be her interest in that Mongol. She knows nothing of the plan. And afterwards, you can blame it all on us. All right. Instruct my warriors. We have already done so, Master. What is the signal for the massacre? The same as for a wedding, Master. Three rockets in the sky. Rockets? What fun! How pretty! Rockets in the sky. <laughs> At 
At the immense distance from thoughts of death in which he lay, rockets meant only a wedding to Temujin. An awfully noisy wedding, to be sure. But when his time came, he'd see to it that he had a still noisier one. And now Temujin did for his brother and sister as Lehi had done for him. He knew that with his father's death, he had become the most ruthlessly hunted of all Mongols. And he drew the pursuit away from them. As for Lehi, she had served the man who despised her so well. That it was far into the next day before they overtook him.
We've got him cornered, Targood said. Just wait till he runs out of loose rocks. I don't think he has any weapons, but Targood couldn't have been more mistaken. Besides his sword, Temujin had a weapon which was to become infinitely dangerous. The head on his shoulders. He's quiet now. Get him. I'll never go in after that Mongol alone. He's too full of tricks. Coward, obey my order. Well, four of you then. Rush him. Take him by surprise. Why don't you come after me, Targut? I dare you to try it. But Targut was in no mood for taking dares. He had a much better plan. Kung sino ang mas may utak sa ilang nalaman. All night and all the next day, Targut did his best to undermine Temujin's endurance. Mongol! Mongol, he yelled. Are you hungry? Come down and take potluck with us. Eat till you burst. Mongol, aren't you getting awfully thirsty in the hot sun? Wouldn't you like a drink of water? Come down. Drink deep. There's plenty of water down here. That Mongol may be my enemy, but I can't help admiring his fortitude. I wonder how much longer he can stand it. Don't worry, he'll come begging. He'll crawl on his belly. But it wasn't Temujin's way to come begging. He just took his suffering out of their sight. Some say that he kept up his strength by eating a part of his leg and drinking the blood. But there are limits even in legend. As we see it, he simply tried to escape along this dangerous cliff. I can't hear him anymore. Do you think he's gotten away? There's no other way out, I tell you. Not even a lizard can scale those cliffs. Just wait. We've got him. So Temujin was dragged before his captor, and now Targut spoke very proudly. Ah, Mongol, where is your valor now, and that famous cunning of yours? Why did you 
Why do we torment an enemy so gallant? Why can't we give him a quick death? Because I have plans for our friend. I want to show him to the Princess Lehi. She seems to find him attractive. Let's see how she likes him now, cowering and whimpering like the dog he is. Soldier, I'm going to be killed anyhow before much longer. Do you think you could bring a doomed man a little water? What's that? He's stolen the horse. After him. Hurry. But Temujin had only bitten a horse to give his enemies some exercise. And the war-wise Amalek had a shrewd idea where to look for him. Amalek, where are you? Hurry! Coming! Here, cut your ropes. I'm leaving a horse for you. Amalek. That is a name I will never forget. And Temujin, sighting his village soon after daybreak, first began to realize the dimensions of hatred. Now he could only hope that his brother and his sister had never reached home. If only his mother was safe. Timujin! Kassar. Where are our people? Killed, many of them were captured. Some fled to the hills. Our mother? We found her unconscious. They must have left her for dead. Come. Come. 
Our mother will be well, Temujin. There isn't a wound on her body. The wound was our father's death, Pijin told him. He was a great man, Temujin, valorous and just. Now you are the new Khan. May you live up to him. May you be a king without equal. Yes, a Genghis Khan. Conqueror of kings, master of all men. Spirits of earth and heaven, hear my prayer. Heed thou my supplication. Endow me with strength to avenge my father and my people. Bestow upon me the wisdom to vindicate my heritage and my intention. Genghis Khan. Spirits of wind and sea, hear my prayer. Oh, hearken to the voice of my supplication. Then throughout the desolation of the Gobi, messengers sped to rally the scattered Mongols crying, the new Khan, Genghis Khan, needs you at the Karakaram, at the place of the black sand. quarters of the winds, slowly a broken people reassembled towards that place, on fire to wreak the vengeance upon their betrayers. And their young king sat above them, second only to himself, those bravest men he trusted most. Paladins, bodyguards, privileged unto the tenth generation to rob, to burn, to kill under the terrible security, a paladin of Genghis Khan can do no wrong. Fearful as were his paladins, the young monarch was becoming a man even more to be feared. For a man who lives only for hatred can forfeit his humanity forever. time when the Mongols were still implementing their vengeance against Borchu. Three of these paladins brought a captive into camp out of the depths of the wilderness. Mighty Khan, this man approached us alone, asking where he might find you. Knowing him for a Taijit, we bound him and bring him before you. Taijit, you killed my father treacherously and you burned my village. Wait. Who are you, Tajit? Amalek. Amalek. Amalek.
my people, Amalek, my paladin, and my blood brother. In Borchu's court, meanwhile, Urgo was presenting another of his plans. This time, it was a way to frighten the stubborn new Khan of the Mongols into submission. And every word he said, the childish Borchu repeated to his daughter so that she would know where credit was due. Urgo's idea was to send a courier with these demands. As a vassalage fee to great King Borchu, Temujin must deliver every seventh day 100 horses, 100 head of cattle, and 100 slaves. If he fails to comply, Urgu finished off, we will raise his village to the ground as we have done before. Then a guardsman brought a most unpleasant message. Highness, three Mongols await you. They claim they are emissaries of Genghis Khan. Urgu, Targut. What has happened? He says there is a greater Khan than me, a Genghis Khan. Fool, the one and only Genghis Khan is the sublime Borchu. Nobody else is ever to be given that name. Urgu, if there is a greater Khan, what is to become of me? Leave that to me, Your Highness. Forgiveness, have mercy. I'll never make the same mistake again. Never again. You are so right. Why did you do that? You know I can't bear the sight of blood. Now you see here. Here is what you must do. Send all your warriors to form a perimeter. Keep Temujin away at all costs. Don't let him infiltrate. He is a fearful enemy. I've heard a lot of tales about him. Hurry. Send those dogs of Mongols in here. We'll see just what they have to say. We come from Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. Chieftain Borchu is the one and only Genghis Khan. Not that dog, Temujin, whom you call master. Why have you come? To pay your taxes? Taxes? That's exactly what we've come about. Exactly. You see, Your Highness, he has surrendered even sooner than we'd hoped. <laughs> what did I tell you, Princess? Do you see how wise your father is? At this very moment, Temujin must be trembling with fear. Speak to me. Where is that dog you call Master hiding? My master never hides. He is nearer than you suppose. His men await my signal. You are surrounded. My master has sent a message for the proper reader which torture could not find. Lend me your dagger. As a tribute to the one who is exalted far above Borchu, I, Genghis Khan, require that you pay me at every seventh sunrise 1,000 horses, 1,000 head of cattle, 1,000 slaves.
If you fall short of my demand by so much as even one beast, I hereby engage to bring your kingdom so low into dust that not one blade of grass shall remain to remind anyone that once upon a time Borchu existed. Your reply, please. Genghis Khan must know immediately. That's my reply. And don't trouble yourself to inform your master. He wrote his message on that head. I'll send him yours. The impudence of such demands. Who does he think he is? Genghis Khan. Thus it was that Fortune lost to a daring abductor, the one creature in the world who loved him, and whom he was competent to value and to love, his daughter Lehi, who even now knelt at the great Khan's feet pleading, forgive him, great Khan, I implore you. Pity my father. He only does the bidding of evil counselors. He is a child. Pity him. Visit upon me the punishments, however cruel you have contrived against him. I cannot ask your mercy. I had no part in planning those crimes against you. But I see only too well that you will never believe me. Kill me then this moment. And may my guiltless blood help wash away the iniquities of my people. Your words are flowers. Once they separated me from my father when he most needed a son to stand up beside him. Can sweet words bring my father from his grave? Your hatred and your cruelty, Genghis Khan, are melodies to my heart. I will begin to die only when you begin to ignore me. So Lehi's penitence of love began. And Fijin, his sister, wiser than either, kept watching them both until she could bear it no longer. Temujin, why do you torment yourself? Why do you pity her? Can you forget so soon that she is one of those who killed our father? How can you pity her? I pity you, my brother. You are the one who suffers every agony she endures. She needs no pity. She knows that all these things are expressions of your love. What are you saying? You are a man. You will never understand it. The joy which can come only out of suffering through another and for another. You do love her, don't you? Never dare speak to me like that. 
Understand? And Fijin watched after him more sadly than ever before. For she knew well that when thus a man makes his heart and his mind strangers to each other, he puts himself in danger. And if he has cunning, his cunning becomes his worst enemy, deceiving his own judgment. I'm worried, Temujin. We need more men, and soon. The raid was a complete success. They must have thought we had an army. Where are the paladins you sent out for fresh recruits? They should be coming back any time. It's until then I'm anxious. Here come a few. Of new men, they brought only a handful, and among them, the most dangerous recruit imaginable. A wily young man disguised as a minstrel and soothsayer. Most dangerous of all to Genghis Khan. For those who cut themselves off from humanity develop a thirst for magic. That night, Ergo told the great Khan's fate. Your path is a labyrinth of inescapable dangers, through which, without ever faltering, you have found your triumphant way. Any fool knows his past. It's the future I want to hear. Can you read the future? I, mighty Khan, by the blinding rationality of the sun, by the blind dreaming of the moon, I am given eyes to read the illegible future. I see a conqueror astride the world. But what is this? Why do you stop? Oh, mightiest Khan, I grieve. You would kill me. The sorcerer's life is sacred. Speak. Command me not, O Khan, else I must obey. And what I must tell you is far too dreadful for your ears to hear and for my lips to utter. I command you. Tell me what you see. I see in the magic smoke, O King, that you have only a little time to rule. I see you dying by treachery at the envious hand of your own brother, Kassar. I see Kassar ruling in your stead. Do him no harm, lest even worse befall us. Now this man had so deeply misled himself that it became a question whether those who most loved him could even yet reach his heart and his mind and restore him to reason. Or whether those who most hated him had already made him forever a prisoner of rage and mistrust and of their mischief.
Release her. She is our princess. What is the meaning of this? Forgive us, dear cousin. We mistook you for one of Temujin's men. Why have you come? If you are recognized, we die. They haven't the slightest suspicion, Urgu whispered. And with the greatest delight in his own cleverness, he proceeded to let her in on his newest and brightest plan. Now he knew Genghis Khan's weakness. Within three days, Borchu could raid him and wipe him out. And Genghis Khan had swallowed the soothsaying whole. Judging by that late light in his tent, he was gnawing his nails. Any minute now, he'd go after Kassar. And from then on, everything would be simple. For whether Temujin kills Kassar, he told her, or Kassar resists and kills Temujin, we will instantly kill whoever survives. Wait. Get horses ready. We must escape while there is still time. I'll just get my cloak. Go. It is my command. Oh, believe me and hurry, for only you can save the lives of your sons. Temujin, she cried, great king, beloved son, you and Kassar took your lives from these breasts. Your flesh, your soul, your blood are the same. If you kill your brother, kill me with him. For if you destroy the branch, you destroy the trunk. Oh, have you lost all judgment? Why do you mistrust those who are most to be trusted? Why do you trust these strangers without even trying to find out the truth? They are spies of Borchu. Spies? Bring these minstrels before me. Too late, my son. They have gone. Kassar, why did you submit if you were innocent? Why didn't you fight back? Because, dearest brother, my mind, my courage, my pride, my very life and soul, they are yours. They are you. All I know is that I only exist to serve you, protect you, die for you if you are in danger. So if you want to see me dead, why should I disagree? I'm so ashamed. Set my brother free. Mother, how did you know all this? Because there is one who values your safety beyond her life, Lehi. Oh, my son, go after her while there is yet time. She commanded the spies to leave and went with them in order to save your life. She betrayed her own kingdom for love of you. Save her, my son. How can I love a woman who is party to my father's murder? How can I trust a woman who betrays her own father and her kingdom? How can you imagine she will not betray us into the bargain? I know Lehi, my son. She'll die for you if need be. 
sa buong desyerto ng Gobe. Ang pagtataksi sa sarili. You know the penalty for treason? Lehi is going to die for saving my life and yours. Stay here if you like. I'd rather risk my life to save hers. And I'm going to. Kassar, wait. Paladins, to your horses. By twilight tomorrow, find all you can of those we sent after recruits. We can look no further. We meet next morning along Bortu's northern frontier. Dear mother, the hour of reckoning has come. The hour of reckoning. There is nothing to discuss. Just sign. That's all. Ibig sabihin ng lahat ng nakasulat dito, Targot, ay isinasaling ko kapangyarihan, ari-arian, at karapatan bilang isang hari ng karay. But what you have written here means that I am transferring to you all prerogatives, rights, powers, and properties which belong to me as chief of the Karaites. Why, if I sign this, Targot, you will be the ruler. Why, yes, you have read it exactly right. Have you gone mad? Don't you realize that death is the penalty for treason? Indeed I do. That is why I implore you, dear sir, to sign that document. To refuse as treason against your ruler. But I'm the ruler. I am. Don't you understand? A ruler, Borchu, sits on a throne. Insolent fool. You'll see. Guards. Guards. Arrest that man. Feed his liver to the dogs. We'll see who's master. Any other orders, Your Highness? Lehi, my daughter, my little girl, she'll avenge me. Just you wait. She'll see to you. I'm sick and tired of this tomfoolery, Borchu. You are an error of nature. You are a ruler only because you were born to it. You haven't a brain in your fat head. You aren't fit to live. Now sign and be done with it. Will you sign or will you not? You, you have told me yourself, Targut, that I have no brains. It's true. Everything I've done as long as I can remember was somebody else's idea. Your stratagems, Urgu's tactics. But there's an ancient saying, Targut, that when a man looks into the eyes of death, fate is kind to him. And at last he sees clearly. I see very clearly, Targut. I know you are going to kill me. I know you want to rule in my place. But I know too that you have only two ways to win what you seek. I sign this abdication or you marry my daughter. As far as Lehi is concerned, you have no chance. She'd be chopped into a million pieces before she would marry a nameless dog such as you. As for me, 
I will never sign this document. You don't believe it, but you'll learn. You have called me an error of nature. You are right. For the first time, you speak honestly to me, and I thank you for it. Thank you still more for forcing upon me this chance to atone for a lifetime of stupid and cowardly mistakes. Oh, it is true, I have never been fit to live. But now I will show you how a king should die. What are you waiting for, Targut? There is my heart. No, Borchu. It isn't going to be so easy as all that. Before I finish with you, you'll scream for death a million times. And bit by bit, in a remote and savage place called the Hill of the Hawks, Borchu began to pay for his moment of bravery. <laughs> I'm so glad you're home at last, Princess. I've waited a long time for this moment, but at last we could talk as we're doing now. I looking down at you, and you looking up at me. This embarrassing inequality could be instantly rectified if you could only see your way clear to make me the happiest. Let's not waste words, Targut. Where is my father? Why won't you let me talk to him? Why have the guards been changed? What are you doing on the throne? Come down from there, I promise you, you'll be sorry. I like your spirit, Lee. It becomes you. It becomes a queen. Guards, soldiers, arrest this cur. Ergu, Ergu, I'm your cousin. I have something very important to say to you, my dear, and I'll thank you not to interrupt me. As you see, you only make trouble for others. Unless you become my queen, Lehi, I cannot possibly become king. Remember, two lives depend upon your decision your father's and your own. Targut, I schemed with you so long as we were ruling for Borchu. That was all very well, being the powers behind the throne. But his life and his throne are sacred. You never told me you plotted against them or planned to marry my cousin. I demand that you apologize to her and set my uncle free. You demand. Bring that fool here. You'd better learn the proper method of addressing a king. And you. How do you want me to get your answer? Gently or... Horrible, isn't it? Can you imagine it? If that wood were living flesh? Such a horrible death can easily be avoided, Princess. All I ask is your consent to marry me. 
totoo ngang nakalalagim ang ganong kamatayan, Sir Gut. Yes, it's really a horrible way to die, Targut. But as the only way out of marrying you, it's a pleasure. Very well. Ergu, whip the horses. Order your men to shoot me, Targut. Wait. Wait for my signal. Now I'll give you your last chance, Princess Lehi, to save your father's life and yours and your cousin Ergo's. For the last time, will you accept me as your husband? It's very simple. Choose me or death. Death, no matter how hideous Targut, is beautiful compared with your face. Besides, you only have the shell of my body left to kill. You killed my soul a long time ago when through your scheming you made Temujin hate me. Urgu, whip the horses. Let yours be the hands which give me the contentment and peace of death and receive my everlasting gratitude. There is your arrows. I'll count three. Unless Urugu has whipped the horses on my third count, kill him.
Can you ever forgive me? Look, Levi, as far as the eye can see, the day will come when I'll conquer all who live there and make them your slaves. Thank you, my master. But I am content to be the slave of your heart. No. It is written in the stars that the day will come when I'll tie a string around the world and lead it to your feet. And the day came when Genghis Khan fulfilled his promise to his beloved. He became quite literally the conqueror of kings, the master of all men. And as far as the eye could see and far beyond, he drowned the world in blood and tears. The time came when, but that, my friends, is another story.